thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about some ongoing work that I've done as a postdoc, first at Colorado State with Ruth Huffbauer and John McKay, and now at Penn State with Jesse Lasky and B.J. Berry. And uh, this work is ongoing, so it's a little bit light on the results, so you have to forgive me. But I've substituted many pretty pictures. <laughs> Okay, so for example, this is a photo of an agricultural field in Wyoming, which is infested with blue mustard, an invasive crop weed that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, yeah. So if you're here for the session, I probably don't have to try too hard to convince you that invasive species um, are these great evolutionary test cases. We can use invasions to ask questions about the role of standing genetic variation, uh, admixture, or novel mutations in adapting to novel environments. So some of the questions that we want to understand are, are invasive species invasive before introduction? In other words, are they sort of pre-adapted to similar environments, and that's what allows them to hit the ground running in a new habitat? Or are introduced species, uh, do they evolve to be more invasive after introduction? And typically we try to answer these questions for a particular species by collecting individuals of that species from the native range and individuals from the invasive range and comparing them and saying that the difference is the result of evolution in the invasive range. I've done this myself in previous work. But I wanted to know if we could perhaps make a better comparison because there's this problem with comparing contemporary individuals from, from the two ranges and assuming that the difference is the result of evolution in the invaded range. First of all, we have to decide what the correct population, native population is to even make this comparison. Uh, that can be really complicated if multiple uh, uh, introductions are involved, for example, in the invasive brown rat, um, or if we lack detailed population genetic data, which is typically the case for most invasive species. Uh, and additionally, it's not like evolution just stops in the native range once uh, uh, a species gets introduced elsewhere. Climates are changing all over the world, so definitely there's evolution happening in the native range as well. So ideally what we could do is observe the direct predecessors of contemporary invasive populations that we're interested in. And so what we need to do that is of course a time machine. Uh, that's sort of what we have in the form of herbarium specimens. Uh, and I just want to dwell for a moment on the impressive amount of data that you can get from an herbarium specimen. So uh, it's a beautiful nugget of data. You can get distribution information, phenology, phenotype, sometimes even uh, biotic information biotic interaction uh, data, and of course you can get genomic data as well. Uh, now they aren't all like this, but this particular sheet represents even a population level sampling um, for the species. And uh, if you compare between different herbarium specimens, you have time ordered uh, genomic data. So using the temporal nature of this genomic data, key population events in the history of a plant invasion can be identified. So with time-separated genomic data, we can watch, we can like watch genetic variation as it changes through time and as the species spreads across novel environments. So for just a handful of species, we have an idea of the level of variation just at this endpoint, um, and that's all we can see. But by using the historic record, we can start to understand perhaps hidden patterns. So something, for example, we'd really like to know is what triggers an invasion. Does an invasive species start to spread just as soon as it's introduced to any place? Um, and did just a single population show up there? So that's sort of the simplest model, continuous population model. Or as is often thought to be the case, is there a lag period? And then what triggers the end of that lag period before a species can really take off and start to spread? It could be that um, it, the time is required for the perfect genotype to show up in this new habitat, and it replaces all others. So this replacement event would be the end of the lag phase. Or it could be that admixture takes place and increases the genetic variation available in the uh, dated range, and it's that, this admixture event that uh, triggers the end of the lag phase. But for, in most cases, for most species, we really don't have enough information to, to know that. So this is where herbarium genomics comes in. And I'm going to use this approach using uh, genomic data from herbarium specimens to look at this uh, particular species, uh, Chorus wartonella, or blue mustard. So it's also known as musk mustard because it's really smelly. If you come up to it in the field, you will smell it before you see it. Um, a few things about this species make it the perfect candidate for the, this work. First of all, it's weedy. It's a weed of winter annual cereal crops, particularly winter wheat and alfalfa. It's also a weed of arid rangelands and roadsides. 
And in particular, um, uh, dairy producers really hate it because if the cows eat it, it gives the milk a bitter taste and foul odor. So the species is native to Eastern Europe, but also parts of Northwestern China and Northern India. Uh, and it's now been introduced into 31 states and three Canadian provinces, basically everywhere uh, west of the Mississippi River. It's also well represented in North American herbaria. So it was first introduced at a point when it could have been collected by botanists thr uh, throughout its invasion. So the earliest um, collection that I know of is from the late 1890s. Uh, and indeed it was collected. So this is a cumulative count of herbarium specimens uh, collected in North America that were included in just a single large aggregator database. So this is an underestimate for sure of herbarium holdings. And finally, it has some really convenient characteristics from a genomics perspective. So this species is in the mustard family, um, which means there are significant genomic resources available for very closely related species. Handily, it's related to Arabidopsis, everyone's favorite model organism. Um, it's a diploid species with a small genome, uh, only about twice the size of Arabidopsis. And it's an annual, which means it's had more opportunity for recombination since the introduction event which will um, increase our ability to identify causal genes underlying selective sweeps. So given these characteristics, uh, I think this work could be especially informative uh, because of the extensive tools available for this family. We could um, use, for example, experimentally validated gene models to really drill down to the functional level to understand how this has evolved since introduction. Okay, to help my genomic analyses uh, along, first I needed to even know what I was looking at when I got sequence data. So I needed a reference genome. Um, compared to DNA extracted from fresh material, uh, DNA genomic data from genomic, uh, sorry, herbarium specimens or ancient or historical DNA typically is weaker, more fragmented, um, and has characteristic damage patterns. Without a reference to compare to, I wouldn't necessarily know if I was detecting fragmented coarse flora DNA or DNA from some other species, such as a bacterial contaminant on the herbarium sheet. Uh, so I put together a first uh, very rough draft reference genome assembly, and I'm still polishing that. I have some details up here if you happen to be an assembly nerd. Uh, I got the DNA for this, um, from this individual from a USDA germplasm population, uh, originally corrected, collected in Iran, so that's part of the native range. Um, and once I had this draft assembly in hand, I could proceed with you working with the herbarium specimens. And first I wanted to see how many herbarium specimens I could actually get my hands on, and it turns out it's kind of a lot. Uh, with the help of just nine herbaria, I was able to sample leaf tissue from 750 specimens dating back to the beginning of the invasion and widely distributed across the Western US and parts of Canada. And there's definitely more out there and I'm always uh, looking to get more tissue. Um, so each of these specimens represents not only a point on a geographic map, but also a point in time and environmental space. And the ultimate goal of this work is to understand the invasion process across these several dimensions. So here you can see sample of density, and it's been roughly by decades, so the years up in the corner here, um, of the samples that I, uh, that I have sampled, uh, the specimens that I've sampled so far. Sorry. The early specimen I have uh, goes back to 1916 from Boulder, Colorado. Um, and with, within a few years on either side of that specimen, I know other specimens from Washington State and New York. So that to me suggests the, per, perhaps there was multiple introductions, but I need genomic data to know for sure. So with the help of some collaborators at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, I got to pull on this extremely fashionable outfit, <laughs> and we produced sequencing libraries from 20 herbarium specimens ranging in time from 1941 to 1993. And we sequence these to low coverage, getting about 10% of the genome to look for patterns of ancient DNA damage. And this is what we found the y-axis here is the number of reads, and each bar is an herbarium specimen with two large reproduction blanks. The brown, uh, the dark brown color indicates the majority of reads map back to my modern course for assembly. So contamination is slow. Uh, and since the low coverage libraries all look pretty good, I got uh, much higher uh, coverage sequencing done. And right now, as we speak, the PSU servers are running the analysis on this data. So watch this space. This, wish me luck, but this hope, work will hopefully be included as part of a special issue on using ancient DNA to understand evolution in the Anthropocene in the Journal of Molecular Ecology Resources, scheduled for early 2020. If that's something you think you might can be able to contribute to, uh, talk to me, and I can give you some more information about that special issue. 
And I have a lot of exciting plans beyond this first study. So some of the cool data you can get from herbarium specimens include biotic interactions, both in just notes that people took, but also, I hope, in getting um, microbial reads from herbarium specimens uh, to understand the historical microbiome associated with this invasion. By sequencing endophytes or even soil microbes, we might be able to observe microbial communities that co-invade, act as facilitators, or even suggest future biocontrol candidates for the species. And in fact, my collaborators and I were just awarded a C grant through Penn State to start to expand this work. I'm really excited about it. Also in the near future, I'm gonna be joining the faculty of Idaho State University this fall. Uh, so in addition to my work trying to understand how invasive species succeed in the face of novel environments, I'll also be looking at an iconic native species, uh, sagebrush, that isn't maybe doing so well, um, and trying to understand its adaptive capacity in the face of climate and land use change, and also how it reacts to invasive species. So this work with native sage species is part of a larger multi-institutional um, gem break project, which you can find more information about at this website. Um, and if you're interested in evolutionary ecology and invasive species and ecological genomics, uh, and generally the kinds of questions that I ask, I encourage you to contact me and talk about the uh, potential of joining my lab in the future. All right, and with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, the herbaria that I've worked with, which have all been amazingly great, uh, and with my funders, and uh, thank you for listening. Yes? So it's interesting, first of all, your shout out to the importance of specimens. Yeah. Um, I think it's fantastic, so thank you for taking the time to talk about the value of all the data. All yeah, absolutely, the, like the foundation of the science. Um, but it's interesting to me that you're talking about really um, evolution that might be happening based on uh, post-introduction, because mm -hmm. it seems like weeds of agriculture would have, I mean, especially coming from the area you're talking about, the Fertile Crescent agriculture mm -hmm. had been going on for thousands of years there, presumably. Wouldn't you expect to see uh, a long history of adaptation to agricultural systems in these weeds? Uh, potentially, and I think that would be really interesting as well. Um, there's, a, there's a hypothesis that uh, one of my collaborators wrote about several years ago called the induced adaptation to invade. I don't know if you've heard of this, but the idea is that first things get a, accustomed to human settings, particularly agricultural settings, and then that sets them up to be able to invade uh, other agricultural settings in different parts of the world. Um, and so I don't have that uh, data that could really address that question because I only have sampled so far in the in introduced range, which I think is somewhat different, if not completely different from even agricultural settings in Europe. But uh, I think it would be really interesting to ask that question with, uh, well, see, people only collected uh, herbarium specimens up to maybe even two or 300 years at the, at the furthest. So potentially it'd be hard to address some of those early changes with this kind of approach. Thank you guys.